Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day. Welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by American Jewish Committee. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. Today is Yom HaShoah, the day of Holocaust remembrance. On this solemn occasion, we are honored to be joined by Holocaust survivor, psychologist, and Jewish advocate, Eva Lichtenberg. Eva, who you don't see on your screen just yet, will join us shortly, as she just concluded a speaking engagement with young students in Chicago, something that is very important to her. Eva, who will be in conversation with Dr. Laura Shaw Frank, AJC Director of Contemporary Jewish Life, will share her story and how her experiences as a child refugee and Holocaust survivor impacted the rest of her life. After we hear from Laura and Eva, time permitting, we will take your questions. You may email your question to questions at ajc.org, that's questions plural, or use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Laura, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Daniel, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm very honored to be here today to be in conversation with Dr. Eva Lichtenberg and to hear her tell her story. But before we hear from Eva, I wanna share a little bit of thought about Yom HaShoah. Yom HaShoah is a day for us to pause and to remember, to pause and to listen, to pause and to reflect. For me, as a child of a Holocaust refugee, it's a day devoted to trying to understand the enormity of what my family lost and what the entire Jewish people lost in the Holocaust. I wanna emphasize that Yom HaShoah is the Jewish community's Holocaust Remembrance Day. It was instituted by the Israeli government in 1959, and it's commemorated each year on the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Now, we are also familiar with the UN's Holocaust, International Holocaust Memorial Day, which they instituted in 2005 and which takes place on January 27th. And as a Jew and a child of Holocaust refugees, I appreciate enormously that the UN has chosen to create a Holocaust Memorial Day. But my Memorial Day and the Memorial Day for most of us in the Jewish community is Yom HaShoah. It's been in existence for 63 years and it focuses specifically and only on the Nazi regime's murder of 6 billion Jews. The Jewish experience was different than any other group targeted by the Nazis. As I've heard it said many times, not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were victims. I deeply appreciate the day that Israel chose to commemorate the Holocaust. They chose a day that tells a Jewish narrative how the Jews responded to Nazi terror, how Jews resisted at every moment and in every way, because this date commemorates the day that began the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So I wanted to take just a minute or two to tell the story of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, beginning World War II, and within weeks, Germany and the Nazi soldiers began moving Polish Jews, then the largest Jewish community on earth at number 3.3 million, moving Polish Jews into ghettos, restricted spaces where they were forced to live in horrible overcrowding with little food and rampant disease. Over time, thousands and thousands of Jews died of starvation and disease, as well as from violent murder by the Nazis in those ghettos. Millions of Jews were deported from the ghettos to concentration camps and the death camps where they were murdered. The largest ghetto was the Warsaw Ghetto. It housed approximately 400,000 Jews, 
My great grandparents, my maternal grandfather's parents, Yisrael and Rachel Gutman, were murdered in the Warsaw Ghetto. So the Nazi regime conceived of the final solution, the plan to extinguish all of European Jewry in the waning months of 1941. And from that point on, the Nazis were working day and night to murder as many Jews as they could, as quickly as they could. By April 1943, the Warsaw Ghetto was much diminished by death and deportation. Nonetheless, a group of young Jews on April 19, 1943, rose up and fought back and rose up against the German tr troops and the police who had entered the ghetto to deport surviving inhabitants. These were lead led by Mordechai Anilevich, who was a 22-year-old young Zionist, and they were young people fighting a battle, not for their lives, because they knew that they couldn't save their lives, but for their dignity. They were armed with arms that they had smuggled into the ghetto and with Molotov cocktails that they created themselves. And they managed to hold off German troops for 27 days. I'm going to repeat that. A group of starving few hundred 20 somethings managed to hold out against the Nazi army for 27 days, which is longer than many sovereign states held out against the Nazi regime. By May 16, 1943, the Germans crushed the uprising and deported 50,000 surviving ghetto residents to concentration camps and to killing centers. But we remember the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto, the Jews who stood up and fought back, and we remember their resilience and their resistance and their bravery and their courage. And I want to just mention one other thing before we turn to, to Eva, which is fighting back with guns and weapons was not the only kind of resistance that occurred in the, in the Holocaust. Spiritual and cultural resistance, saving documents, writing diaries, having bar mitzvahs, lighting Hanukkah candles, having brises, doing all the things that Jews did to insist we are here, we are continuing to be Jews, and we are continuing to live. All of those things are critical as we think about uh, the Holocaust, to remember not what the Nazis did to the Jews, but what the Nazis did with, to the Jews and how the Jews responded at every moment with resilience. So as the years pass and survivors get older, listening to their stories becomes ever more important. And I'm thinking of the words of Elie Wiesel, may his memory be a blessing, who said, whoever listens to a witness becomes a witness. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Today, we are being given the responsibility of becoming witnesses. As we listen to Eva's story, let us take on that responsibility consciously and mindfully. And with that, let's turn to our honored guest, Dr. Eva Lichtenberg. Eva, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for asking me. Let's start by talking a bit about your life before the war. Can you tell us where you were born and what your early life was like? I, I was born in a town called Liberetz in Czech and Reichenberg in German, which is 65 miles north of Prague. At that time, the country was called Czechoslovakia. Now that part of Czechoslovakia is called the Czech Republic. And the, um, the town, a uh, small city, uh, we, uh, I lived, I was born there in 1933 and lived there until 1938 when we left. Uh, my father had a, an iron and steel manufacturing business that had been in, in the family for three generations. My mother was from an adjacent uh, small city, Gablons or Jablonich. Everything was bilingual there, German and Czech. And, and so are the people when they, or were the people when they, they spoke. And uh, until 19th, and we were, we were reformed Jews. We did not go to shul particularly often on Shabbat. However, all the holidays were observed, whether it was Rosh Hashanah, uh, Yom Kippur, my parents fasted. Uh, it was also, uh, now that we're Passover, there was a Seder. 
and Hanukkah, which of course I particularly enjoy, 10 days of, not 10, eight days of lighting candles and getting presents. And that's how we, it was an idyllic life. We had, uh, uh, my father also was a member, was president of the local B'nai B'rith for a while. Um, the house was like a mansion because his business was uh, very much uh, wealth producing. And we had a staff of servants where there was a cook, a governess, an upstairs maid, a downstairs neighbor, an, an engineer living on the premises, a gazebo in the garden, uh, a sandlot and playground for me. And life couldn't have been, from my point of view, better for the first five years. However, my parents were already aware of the looming dangers. Uh, Hitler came to power uh, five months before my uh, birth in, 19, uh, in 1933, and they were already making some attempts to escape to, to, get to some other country of safety, but uh, we did not uh, achieve, or achieve it. Uh, we then left under uh, somewhat duress in 1938. What happened was when we came back from a vacation, all the servants had deserted with a note saying they refused to work for Jews anymore. And also uh, while the negotiations began uh, that led to Kristallnacht and of course uh, the Sudetenland of which that strip uh, of the Czech Republic was called because it was equidistant from Prague and um, uh, Dresden. It was close to, uh, to, to the German border. And uh, pretty soon the uh, authorities, the local authorities under Hitler's Aegeus uh, took the business away from my father and also appropriated the house to give to some local uh, Nazi uh, functionaries or whatever. And we went to Prague with the idea that we would uh, be closer to the embassies and consulates in order to get affidavits or papers permitting us to go to somewhere else in the world. And when you arrived in Prague though, you didn't end up finding safety, did you? Could you tell us what happened when you got there? Yeah, well, um, we stayed in Prague for over a year, still making all kinds of efforts to get out. One of the first things that happened was my father was detained for 10 days. I don't know why or what, neither did my mother for that matter. They came one day, took him out of the house. He was gone for 10 days. Um, and my mother, I, from what she said, I mean, I was a child and I didn't know exactly what she did, but she uh, um, contacted anyone she could for help and pulled some strings and so on and so forth. And 10 days later, he returned. In the meantime, by the time I was six, I went to school there. Of course, at that point, uh, if you were Jewish, you could only go to a Jewish school. You were not allowed to go to any secular school. That was for only the non-Jews. And the Jewish school that I attended had a, um, a re residence uh, attached to it so that some students uh, actually boarded there and some uh, like me were just day students. And uh, one day, when uh, the, the school day ended, uh, this classmate, male classmate of mine, uh, headed for the dormitory. And I asked him uh, why he was doing that because he was a day student just like me. But he said the night before the Gestapo had arrived at his house, shot his father dead in front of his eyes and taken his mother prisoner. And when I returned home, with that story, I, I couldn't fathom, I couldn't integrate it, what was going on. 
And my parents decided that well, all the efforts they were making uh, had to be uh, even strengthened and that we were in and risks had to be taken because if we stayed there, we were in more danger than we if we tried to uh, escape surreptitiously. Uh, so that increased. In the meantime, also, um, I needed emergency surgery on my ears because it was a side effect of measles and pneumonia and God, God knows what, God knows, uh-oh, uh-oh, turn it off. Uh -oh. Excuse that, excuse me, For oversight, didn't turn it off. Um, the, uh, back to the, I needed an emergency server, but another rule in the Czech, in then Czechoslovakia was that um, Jews had to go to Jewish hospitals. They were not allowed either in any, uh, non, in any secular or non-Jewish hospital. The, the operation was long ear, ear problems uh, that could then not be corrected. Um, after several nighttime, always at night, with uh, trying to cross the border to Hungary. Uh, and the reason for trying to uh, do that at night and so on is you needed exit, exit permits and entry permits to anywhere else, which of course we could not get. And so with a small group of people led by someone, and there was always the risk that if you um, relied on some guide, that maybe he would turn you in. He wanted the money, but would turn you in. But you had to take the chances. We crossed the border to Hungary. What that entailed was walking. It was in winter now of um, 19, uh, 1940, January or February, ice, snow, whatnot, a distance of six miles um, with the Czech border uh, somewhere on one side and the, uh, the Hungarian border somewhere on the other. And during that night, my parents uh, took turns carrying me. Uh, we walked the six miles until we were on the Hungarian side of the uh, border. We were heading toward um, um, an aunt, uncle, and uh, their, their, their three children. Um, I had, my father was one of four children. This was his sister married to a Hungarian, and we went to their house uh, in Budapest uh, to stay there with them for a, a very few weeks. Um, the reason for leaving then and going just somewhere to uh, boarding houses or whatever in Budapest for another two months was that uh, Admiral Horthy was in charge of uh, uh, Hungary and he, uh, there were incidents while they, uh, they were, people were, were not being uh, hauled off to concentration camps at that time. Those roundups didn't begin until 1944 and then Alaska included my relatives. But uh, at this point, there were um, some were sent to labor camps. There were, we didn't want to endanger their lives, and also they uh, had ration coupons. Food was tight, food production, and three more people uh, in, in trying to eat from their five ration coupons. We didn't want to do that to them. So then we uh, just stayed wherever we could, hiding out, and continued our efforts. And uh, a little later in winter, uh, probably by March uh, or April, we now surreptitiously wanted to go to Yugoslavia, which was adjacent to Hungary, separated by a river. And uh, doing the same maneuver in terms of heading down to the riverfront, taking a leaking boat, uh, rowboat, and crossing the river into uh, Yugoslavia near Zagreb, but not quite there yet. But we were caught that time. 
And uh, when we got to the other side, lights were shined in our faces and uh, the patrol came toward us, separating me from my parents. My parents were to go one place and I was to accompany them somewhere else. My, my parents protested, I protested uh, to no avail. Uh, the last thing my parents uh, said to me was, pretend you're Catholic, don't admit you're Jewish. And to the rest, you don't know. The latter, of course, was quite true because I didn't know all the, all the specific details of the maneuvers we were doing. In fact, one of the blanket orders throughout the trip was, uh, don't talk German in public and don't, don't answer any questions. Just say you don't know because we were afraid that anything, the, the Czechs and, and the Hungarians would resent maybe the Germans and uh, anything I might say could be used against us. So that was it. I was uh, held for 15 hours, interrogated, not tortured, but frightened um, because I wondered whether I would ever see my parents again. Uh, and as I think about that experience today, I can't help thinking of the, the um, immigration problems we're having and how for, for some time children have been separated in Mexico from their parents and, and believe that it's unconscionable because young children uh, separated at, at a young age from their parents, that, that is very, very traumatic. But anyway, um, when I was released, returned to my parents and I, my, my mother was equally uh, upset by what had transpired, but we were transported to Zagreb which was the capital of that small, not of the Yugoslavia itself, that's Belgrade, but um, Czechoslovakia cons consisted of several provinces and of that particular province, Zagreb was a, was a capital. And the mayor of Zagreb then explained that all these refugees were coming in could not stay there. He wasn't going to offer hospitality or anything else. We were all, there were, as I said, a convoy, and we were all to be dispersed somewhere else, preferably remote, preferably villages rather than any cities, and, uh, and moved about with whatever their, their designs were. So the first stop after that then was Mitrovica, which was um, still on the map, the town, it's actually a resort town of sorts. And we stayed there for three, four months. Um, again, wherever we were, my parents you would take turns going to the capital, capitals of these countries, there are more countries coming, uh, with attempting to get visas, getting to a exit papers, uh, paying whatever the fees you had to pay and so on in order. Our, our, we would accept any country that was not occupied by Hitler that didn't uh, would accept us. Because by this time, this is already after the Evian conference of 19, uh, 1938, where all the various countries where they met at Evian decided they couldn't take it. either no people <clears throat> or very few people. And uh, so also it, it was to no avail for the longest time. In the meantime, um, at, we were transferred from Mitrovica to Ruma, which was one of the most primitive little towns, farm town it's in Yugoslavia. Um, the, the people, uh, the residents of this farm uh, out of the goodness of their heart, I guess, or maybe they were paid, we don't really know, um, took, uh, took us in. Uh, but of course, we all helped on the farm. I collected the eggs from the chickens. My father helped whatever farm work there was. And, and again, while they were there taking turns to go to uh, Belgrade, 
to continue this process of trying to get out. Also, in the meantime, I don't know how they got out of the Czech Republic, but my father's older brother uh, with his wife and daughter, my aunt, uncle, and another cousin uh, arrived on the scene and went and went to the same farmhouse. And we all lived together there for the next uh, many months. Um, and toward the end, the, toward the beginning, well, we, well, as I say, we went, I had to go to school. I mean, it's always very interesting what happened that we were there almost semi-legal, semi-illegally or semi-legally. And when they, when it was found that there was a young child there, of course, it's required by the state. In Yugoslavia, the age was seven years, whereas in Czechoslovakia, it had been six. And I had to go to school, learn the Cyrillic alphabet, and uh, and so on. Um, it, it required walking maybe three quarters of a mile from that farmhouse to the schoolhouse. And again, there were other refugees here and so on. So there were maybe about eight, 10 of us walking. And the local people would throw, uh, especially children as well as adults, would throw stones at us um, and yell slogans of dirty Jews and all of that. And pretty soon, the fathers of these various children uh, three or four at a time would escort us because they were afraid with the stone throwing, of course, some serious injuries would uh, occur. And that's what happened during the rest of our time uh, in Yugoslavia until the beginning of 1941. And at that point from Belgrade, uh, my parents did succeed in getting a visa to the United States. And um, that meant, but my aunt, uncle, and cousin did not. No one knows why. We all applied at the same time, so on. But um, we figured that theirs would come momentarily. We had to leave because a visa had a finite time to be acted upon and completed. You had to complete your ar arrival at your destination. Um, you probably had six, eight weeks, something like that. And if it expired before you arrived there, then, then you were finished. You, you were returned or whatever, but you could not arrive then where you wanted to arrive. So we left right away leaving meant we could no longer get to Lisbon. Italy was at war. Uh, there was no way through. I know some people crossed the Pyrenees uh, to get to uh, Lisbon and there were, there were attempts there to save a lot of people, but we couldn't get to that place either. So the only way we were going to make it was to go the other way, namely across Russia and, across, and through Japan and across the Pacific. And that entails some kind of a story too. Well, first we're going to Bel We have to, to even get to get a boat to get to uh, Odessa in Russia. We have to go to um, uh, to um, uh, Bulgaria. Bulgaria was generally friendly to the Jews, but even there, there were restrictions and so on. And a, and a second separation occurred for me because. Um, I uh, had to stay at a huge barn of a hotel alone for many hours while my parents went to get steamship tickets and take care of some other business. My mother protested and said, I can't leave a, a seven and a half year old child alone. And they said something to the effect, look, lady, if you expect you're going to get anywhere, you follow our orders. And she stays here. Later, when my mother testified for another Holocaust uh, 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 program, um, she explained, I didn't know that until then, that I was a security deposit. I, <laughs> I was the hostage. They were afraid that... Um, if I went with them, they might try some other 
attempt to flee and do something. So they knew if they left me in the hotel room alone or the authorities did, my parents would return. Anyway, that very quickly we went um, to Odessa and then by railroad to Moscow and then by Moscow uh, 10 days on the Trans-Siberian Railway to Vladivostok. And uh, I, I have to explain I, also something I learned later in life, I didn't know it then, um, that uh, the Russians and the Japanese, even though they were uh, eventual enemies um, uh, in the war, uh, they uh, arranged a program for 2,500 people fleeing Jews, mostly Jews, if there were any non-Jews, we don't know about it, um, of which 2,000 after they got to Japan were shipped off to Shanghai and 500, including us, um, were, were enabled to go to the United States. And so, and that program existed from the middle of 1940 to uh, the middle of 1941. It was, it didn't exist earlier and it was discontinued after June of 1941. So anyway, we took a boat from uh, a ship really, from Vladivostok to Tsuruga in Japan. And it was supposed to take two, three days, but there was a typhoon. And not only were there grave questions of whether we would ever arrive there, but we definitely arrived three or four days late. And the boat that was supposed to take the neat that we were supposed to take us to the United States to San Francisco only left every two, three weeks from Yokohama. And by being late uh, as a result of the typhoon, we, we couldn't get to Yokohama in time to catch the boat. Um, so at that point, we went to another city in Japan, we went to Kobe, but I, it it was because we were stuck there now because with the delay, um, the next boat being two, three weeks later and two weeks across the Pacific, we would never arrive in San Francisco in time before the visa expired. And then began the machinations to renew the visa from an Amer either an American embassy or an American consulate. And they were not very generous about that. Um, but there's a grapevine from refugees uh, helping each other in terms of any information they might have that could be helpful. And we learned that um, you go to some remote place in Japan, not to the major cities there, but to this remote place where there was someone there who was very favorable to opening the American borders to refugees. And I don't know what little town or wherever it was, but we went down there, it was south, and we had it each had it, uh, another physical, and then we got the extension for the visa. And then we went to Yokohama, and we got to either the last or the next to last boat. It was named the Nitamaro, and I, I read about it later when it was scuttled, and also that no more boats crossed the um, the uh, Pacific anymore, and two weeks later arrived in San Francisco. <clears throat> and at that point, we took the train to Chicago. And you may ask why we were headed towards Chicago, and that is because our sponsor was there and we had the misguided uh, uh, information. We could have gone anywhere in the United States, but this person, in order to get a visa, you had to have an affidavit that if you went broke, you had to um, uh, have a sponsor who agreed to support you in full so that the state would not have any obligation or any lose any money on you. And this person, not a relative, was um, a school friend of my father still in the, in the Czech Republic. And he had come to America 
when he was about 21, 22 years old and made a fortune as a businessman in some business in Chicago and lived with his wife, who was a Jewish Miss America from 1931. And they lived in Winnetka and he agreed to provide that uh, documentation. And so we went to their house in Winnetka immediately upon arrival in Chicago in, in June, in June of 1941, six months before Pearl Harbor. And we stayed with him for a little bit, but we sensed that his wife uh, was not, was sort of annoyed with three more people in the house and this and that. And um, so after about three weeks there, we moved into the city proper, into Chicago, uh, got a furnish, furnished efficiency apartment. And uh, there we stayed for our first year in the, um, in the United States. And in the fall, in September of 1941, I was enrolled at a nearby public school. I was put back in first, although I was eight years old, belonged in third grade. I was put back in first grade Although by that time I knew a little English, but not too much. Uh, my parents had known English because they had studied British English, King's English, because they had learned it in school. But um, I didn't know a word, but they were quite insistent that I learn English. We still English at home, uh, turned on the radio uh, when we could afford it, went to a movie or something because you heard English spoken. And so began my life in America. Um, the, we are, I'm well aware we are the lucky ones, or at least partially lucky. We were never in a concentration camp and we survived. And we've had a reasonable, though we, the riches were gone, we had a reasonable good life in uh, America, especially me. I mean, I grew up here and uh, so on. However, the blight that remained on our lives forever and mine to this day was that no one else in my family survived. My grandparents were killed at Auschwitz. My uh, aunt, uncle and cousins from um, Budapest were rounded up in 44 and killed uh, in, a, in a concentration camp. Um, my, um, my other uncle, I mean, my, in, in the one that was for, with us for a while in Yugoslavia, uh, was killed in the German bombing raids that began two weeks after our departure. I mean, we, they, we all applied at the same time. And it was luck. And there's always luck in these stories, I feel. Good luck and bad luck. But uh, no matter how bright and percipient you are about the situation. So we got out. They didn't get out. Um, and we, there is one more uh, sibling in my father's family. There, one sister married a Catholic army officer in Prague. Well, it didn't help her finally. Uh, she was killed also, and he was killed in, in the war in, in the war somewhere. So that took care of all of his siblings, which, of course, bothered my father to the end of his life. He had survivor guilt, particularly, and I have some degree for my old my my the uncle the uncle his older brother, because I got very close to him in uh, Yugoslavia. He entertained me and amused me, and he was an artist, and he was also did magic tricks and so on. I loved him. Well, he's gone, and and my grandparents, whom I also loved, um, we said goodbye to them in Prague, actually, because they couldn't travel this way. People have asked me why didn't they come. They all wanted to come. It wasn't that they were going to stay behind or for some reason, or some people denied the dangers. My parents were aware of the danger, but um, my grandparents were over 60 
And in those days, 60 years, it wasn't as young as ours. My grandmother was very heavy and she had a lot of pneumonias uh, and wasn't really that healthy a person. And uh, they couldn't have walked across the border to Hungary or even perhaps been in a leaking um, rowboat on a, on a river and, and all, all these things that happened. And as I say, the rest of them were caught where they were, were caught. So the only bad thing in my life in America here is that there were no relatives. Uh, satyrs with three people, even if you know had a few friends, uh, no cousins, no aunts, uncles, cousins. And um, I wish my life had been different in that respect. But otherwise, uh, we, we, we certain, I would never give up that American citizenship. I, that is dear to me and, and whatever happens politically or whatever, I am eternally grateful that we were, they, that America saved our lives. Your story is absolutely breathtaking and heartbreaking in so many ways. I wanted to ask you, you're a psychologist. Yes. How did your life as a child refugee and a Holocaust survivor impact on your decision to become a psychologist, would you say? I'm glad you asked that. It's a good question because uh, first of all, my parents after that experience, even in the early 40s, uh, urged me, not just encouraged, uh, practically demanded that you that I have a career that even though I was female, that I should be able to earn my own living if it was necessary and have marketable skills in case there was another depression, another war, uh, anyone I married got sick, that I wouldn't be dependent on, on who knows who, but that I would be able to, so I was headed toward, and education was a royal road to that, of course, too. Well, a lot of Jews feel that. But um, there was um, a, 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 another aspect that I would like to touch upon, and that is many of the, um, uh, which, the descendants of the Holocaust emigres, first generation, first generation, if not also in the same boat as I, that I'm both a survivor and daughter of survivors, went into the healing professions. Psychology, psychiatry, social work was a very popular major when uh, in the early 50s, when um, I had finished college and were choosing a, a profession, uh, perhaps if my parents had been wealthier, I would have liked to have become a doctor and gone to medical school, but that was too, A, we couldn't afford it. I mean, as I said, the, the riches were over and it was hard enough for a, fem a Jewish female to get into medical school at that time. And then it would was not possible while you went to medical school to really wor work. <laughs> Whereas if you went into, I went into psychology, not social work, but in any of these psychiatric mental health professions, uh, you could uh, be a research assistant, a teaching assistant. You, you could help yourself a little mon monetarily wise to do this. But we all wanted to do it, I think, perhaps to help others. So after what we'd been through, we certainly were aware of what kind of hardships, all kinds existed in the world, not just the Holocaust, but other kinds of uh, things that impinge on young people's mental health and so on. And we wanted to help ameliorate that. And also <clears throat> by ameliorating it for others, you're getting some gratification yourself. And I think that's why I chose psychology and I've been very happy with it. I, I've worked, uh, all, well, practically all my life here uh, because I did have these various assistantships and et cetera. And um, even after I had my son, psychology, fortunately, 
you you can you don't have to work full time. You can do something part time. So when he was very little, I could spend the, the good time with him. But then as he grew older and he was busy after school with his sports and this and that, I made my practice more full time. And I, I to this day, I'm gratified by doing that. It's so uplifting to hear about how how much you took what happened to you and sort of brought it into such a meaningful career. Um, I want to ask you one last question, which is, I wanted to ask you to share what lessons your experiences left you with and what messages you want to leave our viewers here with today. Well, a number. Um, one of the things is what happened in Germany uh, needn't have with Hitler happened. If people had responded more quickly to the inroads he made on aspects of freedom, uh, I mean, what was insidious is dictators, fascists begin with little with little uh, tightening of the screws, they eliminate a little of this or eliminate a little of that freedom or and so on. And people tend to say, well, I don't like it, but I can get along with this. Um, it, it, it doesn't have to ruin my life. Well, after they get used to it, and after a few months or a year, the, these the dictators, fascists, turn, tighten the screws some more and have some other restriction, whether freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom, um, certain rights and privileges that certainly we as Americans take for granted, but it can happen anywhere. And pretty soon after you wait long enough and you don't resist because you think, well, I don't want to make waves and I can adjust to this before you know it, uh, life is completely different and you no, no longer have any freedom. And that is, an, and that's one of the reasons, of course, that I'm active in the American Jewish Committee because they fight these kind of injustices or uh, abrogation of civil rights, human rights, wherever they occur in the United States, but all over the world. And they do that even for people who are, it isn't just for Jewish, although it's called the American Jewish Committee, but you realize if it happens to other people, who it could happen to the Jews too, it can happen to anyone. And that you have to tackle these up front and um, defend the freedoms and, uh, make sure that they remain in force. I think it also applies to uh, Israel. I mean, there are many reasons why Israel should exist. I'm not saying this is when is the only one, but obviously if there had been a Jewish state, if there had been somewhere where the Jews could have gone when the Holocaust began, then more Jews would have been saved instead of uh, six million people slaughtered, maybe much less, uh, maybe all. And these days, at least, should, uh, we hope, never again. We say never again. But if something were to happen and you were Jewish and you, or you, you, you sought safety, uh, Israel would take you in and you, you, you would have a haven and so on. I mean, unlike, I will quote, that what the Canadian prime minister said when asked, well, would you let some Jews in? How many Jews would you like, would you let, admit to Canada? And his answer was, which is the title of a book about all of this is, none is too many. Well, in Israel, we, uh, many, who, who want to go there can go there. Absolutely true, which is why we need a safe and secure Israel forever, forever, forever. I think we have time for a couple of questions. I'm going to turn things over to Claire, who's been gathering questions from our audience. Claire? Thank you, Laura. So Eva, our first question is from Simon Radner in Boston, who's asking, first, thank you for sharing your inspiring story. 
And do you think that public schools should be required to teach students about the Holocaust? Why or why not? Yes, I think they should. I mean, some colleges are now too. I mean, it isn't only the, it, suppose it's required in Germany, although how it's applied is another question sometimes, but um, I think everyone should know about it. I mean, that's part of a general education. And when they teach about World War II, it isn't just that we were fighting Japan and we were fighting Germany and this and that. I think they should know why this, uh, how this war started, why it started, and, and that we all have to be alert. Uh, and only by knowing our history can we make some attempt on controlling the future. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sasha Martins in Miami, who says, as more and more time passes since the end of the war, how can we effectively transmit memory about the Holocaust to the next generation? Well, that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> um, that part of it would be teaching it in the school. Uh, part of it is um, talking about it. Of course, the direct generation is dying. I'm, I'm going to be 89 years old in, in June. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I'm not going to be around forever. And, neither, and, and some of the people who've had these experiences have already uh, passed on. But uh, there are many books about it, but it's hard, harder to, re it's also in fiction. I mean, movies and television plays are all are a good a good way to some extent because people get pulled into a good plot and then become curious how much of it is is actually true how much of it is fiction or may want to read more details about it but um it should be kept in museums we all have a lot of museums um and um, I mean, in Washington D.C., in Skokie, here uh, in uh, in New York, and and uh, Los Angeles, and so on. All of that's to the good. To the good. But human nature is the way it is, and I suppose when it uh, becomes an ancient chapter of history, it, it's less of a uh, powerful. Uh, uh, account than when it, it still is to some degree current. But I do think uh, it should be remembered. And that's why we're commemorating this day. It is a day of commemoration. And uh, we, we are all talking about it. Thank you. And Laura, I'll turn it over to you to close us out. Eva, yes. I want to thank you for sharing your incredibly powerful story of loss and of resilience. And I want to say that you are an inspiration to me, and I think to everyone here today. And I want to promise you that we are your witnesses, like Ellie Wiesel said. I also would like to thank everyone for joining us today. And I want to wish everyone a meaningful and commemorative Yom HaShoah. Have a good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you.